Good evening. My name is Eric Banks, and I'm the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural annual lecture in the humanities, co-sponsored by the Institute and Princeton University Press, along with the NYU College of Arts and Science. In what I hope will be the first in a long and rewarding collaboration with our friends at the press, we are delighted to, to welcome the distinguished historian Thomas LeCur to speak to us this evening on his intriguing topic, The Work of the Dead, How Caring for Mortal Remains Has Shaped Humanity. Since its founding nearly 40 years ago, the New York Institute for the Humanities has sponsored public lectures by some of the most prominent scholars whose work bridges the academy and the larger arena. They exemplify the dual role of passionate and decisive work in the humanities, providing both exacting scholarship and creative engagement with their subjects, and sharing the news of why their engagement matters to all of us, whether we are close colleagues in an academic department or far-flung readers of their books and essays. Not long after the Institute came into being, a series of talks titled The James Lectures was begun to make public the kind of work that the, that the Institute hopes to share. The roster of those who spoke at NYU in the James series in that first year alone is truly astounding. Among them were Susan Sontag, Virgil Thompson, Bernard Henri Levy, Charles Rosen, Harold Bloom, Roland Barthes, V.S. Naipaul, and Paul Ricoeur. It is our humble hope that the annual lecture in the humanities can measure up to the terrific example set in the first days of the Institute's history. When I became director two years ago, the first person I reached out to was an alumnus of the James Lectures, the art historian T.J. Clark. It was precisely his book, Picasso and Truth, From Cubism to Guernica, that I wanted him to revisit at NYU, and I was happy that he was able to do so. Picasso and Truth was an example both of the model of public engagement through scholarship and what could be more public in its address than Picasso's great mural, and of the kind of work that is regularly published by Princeton University Press. I was delighted that PUP was as, as excited about the possibilities of endowing an annual uh, talk as we were, and I am very glad that you have all joined us this evening for the first such event. Before I introduce Thomas LeCur, I'd like to take a moment to thank a few individuals who were crucial to launching this event. First, Gabby Starr, the Dean of the College of Arts and Science, and Joy Connolly, the Dean for Humanities, who herself has published with Princeton, have been enthusiastic supporters of this endeavor from our first contact, and we are tremendously grateful for their support. Provost David McLaughlin and Vice Provost Uli Baer have been stalwart supporters of the Institute and its mission, and we are thankful to them as well. Melanie Rehack, the new uh, program manager of the Institute, was instrumental in, in every detail of organi organizing tonight's event. And finally, at Princeton University Press, we have many individuals to thank, but in particular, Brigitte Van Reinberg and Rob Tempio had the inspiration to suggest this collaboration. It has really been Rob's vision, uh, born as I understood it, out of a suggestion a few years ago from Robert Silvers, the editor of the New York Review of Books and a fellow of the Institute, that the press try in New York a lecture series it had established in London. I am very glad that Rob and the press have pursued this idea. Julia Hoff has been an indispensable partner in publicity for this event, and I really appreciate her hard work on it. Uh, and I would especially and finally like to thank and welcome to the stage the director of the Princeton University Press, Peter Doherty. Peter, thank you so much, and we're glad to welcome you here this evening. Thanks so much, Eric. <clears throat> I bring you uh, warm greetings from Princeton University Press, the pride of central New Jersey. Um, when I was last here to hear a uh, PUP author speak, it was Angus Deaton who won the Nobel Prize in Economics two weeks ago, so we're on a bit of a roll. Um, tonight's lecture marks a special moment for PUP because it celebrates the humanities, and we have invested heavily in the humanities over the past 10 years, reviving our poetry and art history lists, strengthening our classics list, and adding a humanities editor in the UK. In the UK all against the powerful backdrop of our history list, uh, made all the stronger by our new book by tonight's lecturer, Thomas LeCare, The Work of the Dead. Uh, before returning the floor to Eric, I'd like to thank the people who organized the lecture, our colleagues at the New York Institute for the Humanities and NYU's Colleges, College of Arts and Sciences, uh, as well as my colleagues, Brigitte Van Reinberg, uh, Rob Tempio and Julia Hobb, and I will, on that note, return the mic to you, Eric. Thank you so much. I recently met a colleague who was a professor of law at Columbia for dinner. 
And when I arrived, he was in the middle of a long review essay in the London Review of Books. When I asked what he was reading, he didn't reply a review of Christopher Clark's The Sleepwalkers, but Thomas Lecure's review of Christopher Clark's The Sleepwalkers. Thomas Lecure is one of the few practicing historians who would merit such a remark. His work for publications like the LRB constitutes an event in itself, and to review his CV is to see the work of an author whose just celebration as a great historian is, ma is matched by his commitment to writing with intelligence, integrity, and gusto on a range of topics for a wider audience. When he, when he and I first spoke about the details of tonight's event and the title of his talk, it happened to be at the moment that paleontologists announced the astounding discovery of a large dark chamber for the dead of a previously unidentified species of the early human lineage, dubbed Homo naledi. The 1,500 plus fossil elements belong to some 15 individuals, and their very discovery threw into relief the whole idea of what it meant to care for the dead. Besides introducing a new member of the prehuman family, the discovery suggests that early hominins intentionally deposited bodies of their dead in a remote and largely inaccessible cave chamber, a behavior previously considered limited to modern humans. More specifically, in the context of tonight's talk, the discovery shows how the, quote, work of the dead can take place at a distance in time almost impossibly great to fathom, in this case, 2.5 million years. But it was impossible for me not to think of Lecure's new work without that prehistory of the species' existence, forming an awe-inspiring glimpse over the horizon. The work of the dead is Lecure's magnum opus, an astounding uh, investigation into how the dead body matters in culture, in history, across the disciplines of the humanities. As in all his writing, it manages to turn a series of questions into an ambitious and creative work of sweeping and extremely readable history. In this book and in the lecture he will deliver this evening, he asks, why do we as a species care for the bodies of the dead? What work do the dead do for the living? How do specific ways of disposing the dead and specific memorial practices create communities, nations, and cultures more generally? There has been a long tradition, as he notes in the book, of treating much or all of the care for the dead as folly, from Diogenes to Jessica Mitford. But if Mitford could summarize our current way of caring for the dead as a, quote, huge, macabre, and expensive joke on the American public, the curse shows how deeply embedded our way of thinking about the care of the dead and what death leaves behind, the dead body, is to our way of thinking about our lives. The care of the dead does, in his words, massive work for the living. His book puts me in mind, in fact, the death-obsessed poet Philip Larkin and his great memorial meditation on the passage of time, an Arundel tomb. How Larkin managed to crown his evocation of a 14th century effigy of an earl and a lady, and of course, the, the little dogs under their feet, in the Sussex Cathedral, with the imperishable lines, quote, our almost instinct, almost true, what will survive of us is love, had always seemed an astonishing fusion of the living and the dead. It still is, but in the wake of Lecure's work, it is all the more sparkling and oddly completely alive, less a conceit than a fact of life, a breathtaking assessment of the work of the dead. I am extremely honored to welcome Thomas Lecure to New York for tonight's talk. He is the Helen Fawcett Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley, where he has taught since 1973. For four decades, his work has been on the pioneering edge of the history of sexuality and the history of the body. The Work of the Dead is Lecure's fourth book. He's the author previously of Religion and Respectability, Sunday Schools and Working Class Culture, 1780 to 1850, which was published by Yale University Press in 1976. Making Sex, Body and Gender from the Greeks to Freud, published by Harvard University Press in 1990. And Solitary Sex, A Cultural History of Masturbation from Zone Books in 2003. He is also the editor with Catherine Gallagher of Making the Modern Body, published by the University Press in 1987. Following Lecure's talk, you are invited to join us uh, for a reception next door and to avail yourself of the opportunity to purchase the new book. Please make sure your cell phones are turned off and please join me in welcoming Th Thomas Lecure. This last, I, I had no part of the selling books. That's the shameless commerce division of the, of the Institute. So I wanna answer uh, the question of why we care for the dead uh, in, on two time scales. Um, the first of these time scales, as, um, as Eric suggests, is a very long one. Uh, it's anthropological deep time, measured in millennia or even more millennia. In that, in that register, I want to offer answers that are repeated with variations again and again, iteratively, through the ages. And the second part of my talk, and the second time scale, is this 
scale of generations or even of moments. It's a, it's a register we can speak about with some specificity with reference to how and why in very particular cases, caring for the dead changes um, and why we care for particular dead uh, at particular moments in time. So I'm going to start with the broad anthropological for the first half of the talk, and then I'm going to speak about the very particular um, and more concretely historical for the second part of the talk. So the first of my answers is really uh, almost cosmic, and the other is very local. So I want to begin with an outrageous argument by an outrageous man, which is to say by Diogenes the cynic, the dog philosopher. He's famous for asking Alexander to get out of his light and for many other outrageous acts, which I won't go into. Um, so he was asked by students um, <clears throat> what he wanted done with his body. And uh, he said, or at least Sissa reports him as saying, I, he ordered himself to be thrown anywhere without being buried. And when his friends replied, what? To the birds and the beasts? By no means, says he. Place my staff near me that I may drive them away. <laughs> but how can you do that, they answer, for you'll not perceive them. Well, how am I then injured by being torn apart for these, by these animals if I have no sensation? So when Plato, his younger contemporary, was asked what sort of a man Diogenes was, he said, Socrates gone mad. <laughs> and what he means is, I think, that in, in Diogenes, this, a, a philosophical pursuit of virtue had sort of gone off the rails. Um, his view on the dead, as on other matters, have a certain lunatic uh, quality. He was a clown, and maybe the most famous clown and derelict in history, who tested the limits of culture uh, and its convention. In the sense, he tried to, uh, to be, live in accord uh, with nature. The dead body is nothing, and it makes no difference what one does with it, full stop. Now, Socrates had sort of hinted at this, at this idea when he told Crito that he, Crito, would not be laying out or carrying out or burying Socrates because Socrates would no longer be there. They say he, Socrates, cared little about how he was buried. Bury me in any way you like if you can catch me, and I do not escape you. But on the hand, Socrates didn't ask his students to reject custom. Diogenes the cynic did. So in a world in which the great tragedians write about the horror of being left unburied, I mean, that's what the Antigone is about, and when Yahweh tells the Israelites that the cost of their disobedience would be that their carcasses would be food for the fowls of the air and under the beasts of the earth, he wanted something quite preposterous, to have his body tossed over the walls and to be ostentatiously returned to nature. Now, Diogenes' argument would have many uh, fans over the years, including, maybe implausibly, St. Augustine, and yet, much praise as it is, and much quote over a thousand of years, it remained culturally and emotionally unacceptable. The response was always, yes, right, good point, but. So little that we do, I want to suggest, is more protean and more generative in some sense that arguing in, our, in words and in actions against Diogenes. Of course comes the collective voice in thousands of different timbers. The dead are not refuse like the other debris of life. They're not to be left for the beats to scavenge. They remain part of culture, base as they are. As a class of beings, they don't revert back into nature easily or on their own. Instead, instead, the dead, and I mean here the dead body in this instance, though I'll be talking about the relationship of the dead body to the dead um, throughout the talk, but I'm speaking here of the, of the body. Um, we, as a species, we've got the example of and even pro proto-species, um, care for the dead. We live among them. We make them ciphers of memory. They're the guarantors of land and, and authority and power. There's, in some sense, the temporal foundations of human communities. The fact that the dead body bears meaning, that it needs to be cared for, I want to suggest depends less on what we might call loosely someone's religious beliefs um, or metaphysical views. Um, then on certain ethical obligations that we, the living, owe them, the dead, in general, and certain of the dead in particular. Or we put it differently, the fact that we care for the feelingless dead body is the product of qualities that we attribute to it in a primordial sort of way. The history of much of human culture and thought can be written in our resistance to Diogenes, not, as I said, because of particular beliefs, these, I want to suggest, are kind of back formations. 
but because of, and for want of a better word, a kind of primal idolatry. We know the dead body is just matter, and yet it's always more whatever we might purport to believe about where the dead are, or what they are, or who they are. So back to the question why this might be the case. That is, why do we not, in fact, follow Diogenes' advice in our care for the dead? One set of answers that I want to suggest depends on the claim that we have a sort of primordial aversion to the uncared for, that is to say, to the bereft dead body. So here's how an 18th century clergyman puts it. The dead naturally tend to destroy the life of others, and that's really the reason men naturally abhor the sight or the touch of the dead. The natural spirit of life is afraid of the dead body and has an abhorrence of it, which is why we can't just toss it away just out of sight but need to deal with the, this dangerous thing in a ritualistic fashion. So you can put also this kind of claim in this sort of more timeless psychoanalytic language. So Kristeva writes, the corpse seen without God and outside of science is the utmost of abjection. It's death infecting life. As in true theater without makeup or mass, refuse and corpses show me that I am permanently thrust aside in, the order, in order to live. There I am at the border of my condition as a living being. So without God, outside science, outside culture, that is the corpse, as Diogenes proposes it, is fundamentally, sort of foundationally abject. So there's a second kind of answer that we can give to the care of the dead, which is grounded in a sort of fictive 18th century anthropology that the Enlightenment thinkers were very fond of, but also goes much, much further back. And this is the idea that the care of the dead stands at a kind of ground zero of an origin story. So Hegel, for example, argued that the tomb is the first work of the symbol-making architect in distinction to the house, because the house is but a life-conserving structure of the builder, and the tomb, the house of the dead, is enters, makes humans enter into the world of symbol, into the world of memory. And Vico writes that where you see tombs, there you see the civilization. So that it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a fixture of, of, of enlightenment anthropology to see this care of the dead at the beginning. But that argument, or version of that argument, goes well beyond Europe and goes well beyond um, uh, the, the, the 18th, uh, the, the, the 18th uh, and 19th century. Humans have clan names according to a Chinese compilation of ritual and ceremonial texts from about 1000 BCE, in order to distinguish themselves from the beasts, to order the generations, and to induce men to love each other during life, and to mourn each other in the case of death. So we name the dead as, as a way of ordering generations, and in a sense, in a way of, of ordering kinship, which is, gets through to the incest taboo, which I'll get to in a second. So they also is continues specifically to exist to prevent marriage to others of the same, of the same clam names. So there's a, I want to just say a little bit more about that because I want to say it's not just Chinese, it's not just, it's not just uh, enlightenment. It's a way that people have, all, whether it's true that early humans always did this, I don't know, I'm not a paleoanthropologist, but it's pretty true that people have always claimed that that's the case. So that's really the argument I want to make. I don't want to stand up here and say I have a view on whether which version of, ancient, of Stone Age men buried and didn't bury. So, so let me just give you an example from, from Grotius, uh, the founder of um, Modern Law of War. And he compiles um, a library of opinions and practices from antiquity to show that the denial of burial, that is to say following Diogenes' prescription and just tossing the body over the walls, was a just cause of war because it was so fundamentally at odds with any conceivable regular order and any account of human beings, human creatures in culture. This is, him, this is Grotius speaking. Hence it is, he said, that this good office of burial was said to be performed not so much to man, that is a particular person buried, as to humanity, that is the human nature in general. Wherefore Seneca and Quintilian call burial a piece of public humanity, and Petronius, a piece of humanity derived down to us from my ancestors. And then Grotius goes on and lists the catalog of the reasons, which goes on for pages, and it's actually sort of a learned account back to the way back in Greek history. So the right to burial was, a, was common to all civilized nations. It came from the gods. It was evidence of our common nature, of compassion and religion, 
of humanity. Care for the dead represented the advent to of the Olympian gods. The giant, says Motion, a Greek tragic poet who is roughly Diogenes' his contemporary, used to devour the dead bodies of men, the abolition of which burial practice, of which, of which brutal practice, is signified by burial. So the advent of the Olympian gods is coterminous with the advent of not eating the dead, uh, but of burying the dead. So there are many, many such origin stories, but what I would just tell you, these origin stories are ubiquitous. So let me sum up this whole line of, <clears throat> of answers. There is a timeless need, or perhaps a need expressed in the liminal temporality between human time and natural time to care for the dead body, and it's articulated over and over again as foundational. The care of the dead is taken to be a, if not the sign, of our emergence from the order of nature into culture. It is, as, as, as Gottimer puts it, the immutable anthropological background for all human and social changes, past and present. And he, let me, he continues, because this is really a foundation of, I actually believe this when I'm about to read you. The burial of the dead is perhaps the most fundamental phenomena of being human. Burial doesn't refer to a rapid hiding of the dead, a swift clearing away of the shocking impression made by one suddenly struck fast in leaden and lasting sleep. On the contrary, by a remarkable expenditure of human labor, there is sought an abiding with the dead, indeed a holding fast to the dead amongst the living. We have to regard this in its most elementary significance. It's not a religious matter or a transposition of religion into secular customs, mores, and so on. Rather, it's a matter of the fundamental constitution of human beings from which derives the specific sense of human practice. We are dealing here with life that spiraled out of the order of nature. As I say, I think this is roughly right, and I take Gadamer's phrase, elementary significance, um, to be a, an echo of, of Levi Strauss's elementary structures <laughs> of kinship, which argues that the incest taboo stands at the sort of border, the liminal place between humans and nature and humans and culture. So in some sense, the argument I want to make is that these burial, by which we mean a general ritual care of the dead, is the kind of other end of, of, of keeping matter in culture, rather, uh, instead of bringing matter into culture. So my first answer in response can be summed up in this liminal moment of culture spiraling out of the order of nature. <clears throat> my second answer to Diogenes moves from the, the realm, into the realm of history uh, um, via sort of anthropology. It's the claim that in general, and in particular circumstances, the dead do work for the living. That's what, that's what, book, that's what the book's about, the work of the dead. Put in its strongest terms, they make civilizations. More modestly, they make nations and communities and affinities of all sorts. Now, I, I'm, I'm not delusional. I understand that doing, I'm not speaking of zombies either. Um, we are doing things to the dead. But we need them to do the work they do more than they need us. The dead, as elements in a sister of, of, of meeting made from their matter, are not really dead. In Spain, Lorca famously said, the dead are more alive than the dead in any other country in the world. <laughs> Whether that's, I don't, leak what, I don't want to leak standings on this question, but Richard Cobb, the French historian, puts it in some way in a more generalizable form. He said the most dangerous person at a funeral is the one in the coffin. The history of the dead, then, is a history of how these dead dwell in us individually and communally, and how from these places they act in the world. It's a history of how we imagine them to be, how they give meaning to our lives, how they, are, how they structure public spaces, politics, and time. So the history of the work of the dead is, in the first instance, a history of the imagination, a history of how we invest the dead. And as I said, I'm speaking primarily in this talk about the dead body with meaning. It's really the, mo the greatest possible and sometimes the most expansive history of the imagination. We know the dead are not able to speak, writes an 18th century clergyman, for they are silent in darkness. They cannot see or walk or handle things with their hands either. Yet they do speak differently from the living. And then he quotes St. Paul. St. Paul preached to the Hebrews that he being dead yet speaketh, and more generally, 
It's common in the scriptures for inanimate objects to be representative of speaking as well as hearing. Did I say we endlessly invest the dead body in meaning because somehow through it the dead, let's just say the human past, speaks to us. I think this is the case, as I suggested earlier, independently of specific views or theories about death of the dead. Or maybe it's, it, it competes with these views. But there, there is an enlightenment moment, I think, when history seems to take the place of metaphysics as the foundation of our investment in the dead. And I want to illustrate this point with a brief reading of, a, of an English Enlightenment text um, by, the, by the philosopher and um, uh, novelist uh, William Godwin. And it's a text published in 1809, and it's called Essay on Sepulchres. Um, in some ways, it's a book about, you'll see, sort of secular necromancy. That is, Godwin believes nothing of what St. Augustine or St. Thomas, for example, believed about the cult of saints and the importance of their bodies, and yet he speaks very much in their terms. The weight of anthropology of the dead in deep time, that is to say there's a civilizational accretion of millennia of classical and Christian necrology, informs his arguments for mobilizing the dead to create a national past, even though in fact he wouldn't believe in any of it, and I'll get, be more specific about that in a second. So Godwin's tract, as its uh, subtitle is, it's a proposal for erecting some monument memorial, some memorial to the illustrious dead in all ages on the spot where their remains have been interred. And the reason he was going to do this was a first step of a kind of a utopian plan um, to map a national necrogeography um, in such a way as to resist the inevitable erosions of time and to sort of produce a community of the dead out of, out of England. Like the whole country is a great national is a great national cemetery. So the places where these noteworthy bodies would be buried would be identified by name, so like today's historical signs, are, and, and they'd be marked on maps, just like we now mark, he says, the place of, of famous battles. And this, he said, would eventually result in an atlas of those who have lived for the use of men hereafter to be born. And they would keep, them, keep, keep, these, keep these in memory so they wouldn't be forgotten. So you would have a national community of the dead, and this would be, this would be useful and edifying uh, to, to generations to come. So he offers this proposal as a way to avert oblivion through the perpetual care of the bodies and the names of, of the dead for the sake of mankind. The recollection and admiration of the dead, he says, made possible by knowing where they buried will make us better people and the world a more virtuous, a vir more virtuous uh, place. So that's an important sort of claim, and it's going to be the kind of claim that's going to end up producing national cemeteries of all sorts and, and political cemeteries of all sorts. It's going to be sort of a foundation of, of marking bodies all over for all sorts of reasons. But that's actually not the thing I want to focus on right now. I want to focus on the more intimate story of Godwin's relationship to the dead body. So he wrote this as, uh, 12 years after Mary Wollstonecraft died, uh, giving birth, as you know, to the girl who was going to end up marrying Shelley and writing Frankenstein. And he's still in mourning for her. He speaks of his throughout this text, but it's perfectly clear that he means her, her death that is, is central to him. The enormity of death, the greatest of earthly calamities, and the most universal which is a, her death, still weighed on his heart. The dead are gone, he reflects, beyond all the powers of calculation on earth. The effects flowing from the mortality of, from, from the fact of mortality to man and human affairs is incalculable. And he wants to then say that being, that this loss is greater for those who are surviving than for those who have died, not because, as Augustine or St. Or, or St. Thomas would read because the dead are comfortably at the mercy of God, or because, as the Epicureans would say, it makes no difference anyway, the dead after they die are no more than before they were born. Um, the real reason it's so difficult for the living is because they can't be sure that the dead are anywhere. His central question is, where are the dead? So Godwin, like Augustine in this respect, tries to bridge this unimaginably great divide between these two worlds of the living and the dead through attention to the material bodies of the special dead. 
The question then that I want to pose right now is why is it that for someone who's as close to an atheist as you're going to find in the late 19th century, the dead body is able to do this. In other words, he's, he's not supposed to be able to speak of, of, the, of the aura and the bones of the saint or the sacrality or hic locos est, is some, that's not in his metaphysics. So you want to ask, what, what, what is, what, how is he doing this? So he offers, a, he offers um, a psychology and a theoretical anthropology of the dead. For those he survived, he says, anything associated with a friend, possessions, the furniture they used, have the virtue which the Indian is said to attribute to the spoils of him he kills. Now that's an, also a kind of an amazing analogy for a representative of enlightenment, self-conscious representative of enlightenment rationalism. But in any case, um, is that a, there's a, an emotional alliance for this man um, with, with, this, with the practice of, of, the, of, of Native Americans to, to value these, these things of the aspect of the bodies of the dead. He explains what he means. Everything which has been practically associated with my friend acquires a value from that consideration. Her ring, her watch, her books, her habitations. Now, it's exactly the same argument that Aquinas makes, citing Augustine, for why the affects of a saint who's now in heaven are so precious to, to, um, uh, to the living. But that's not exactly what could be Godwin's argument. There's a far more powerful connection to the person of, he wants to say, of a, the, of, of a, a connection to the person of this friend than the things he owned, or she owned. And that connection, um, that connection is the body. The body of my friend, the vehicle to which her knowledge and virtue was con conveyed to me is now nothing but needs to become something. And he's perfectly clear that he is willing to believe that the spirit of the dead are somewhere, but he's, not, he's specifically not interested in the spirit. He's interested in the body. Her body is far closer to that person than even her watch or her book. Godwin then is all too aware, though, that there, is, that there exists no more radical rupture than between the living and the dead body. If its rosy you could somehow be purchased, it would be my companion still, which it painfully is not. The corpse is the great paradigmatic reminder for us of the system of the universe, that we're all of degraded nature, we're all of humble origins, that we're mortal, that there's an abyss between the living and the dead. So we cast our bodies into the ground in some sense as a token of that truth. And yet, and yet he wants to say, the corpse remains strangely still the person it was, lacking only what seems so little yet so great, the breath of life, the rosy you, the corpse and the person he wants to say are not irrevocably sundered. So he, he, um, he resists what would seem the self-evident truth that the dead are really gone, that they're no more in this world, and he therefore asks the next and obvious and universal question, if the dead are not gone, then where are they? Where is my friend? The, the answer is, as I say, not given by faith, and not given by the spirit. The answer is given by the epitaph, here yaket. Here lies dead over the place where the body is deposited, an indexical sign. And now Godwin somehow mo mobilizes this remarkable power of the imagination and creates a microcosm of the kind of stories that I've suggested of these stories in very deep time. One would have to say, have an impenetrable heart, not to feel a certain sacredness of the grave, a sensibility as old as the writing of the subject of death and a generative. Based on this intuition, this feeling, Godwin proposes necromancy. The habit of seeing with the intellectual eye things not visible to the eye of the senses. Rescuing the illustrious dead, in this case, the dead, from the jaws of the grave. Making them pass in review. Querying their spirits and recording their answers. Having live intercourse with the illustrious dead of all ages. So he wants to do more than... Um, than just call individuals back to, back to life by name, marking their names in these places, hallowed by the reception of all that is mortal of these glorious beings, and erected a shrine to memory, is de facto creating a community of the holy dead 
without believing in holiness. It's a way of communing with each and every one of them without subscribing to any traditional religious views of how and why this might be possible. He then tells you that he knows, that he, he offers what is a formula for this necromancy and for the veneration of relics, which he doesn't believe um, and which the, the national church vigorously disavows. He says, we indulge all the reality that we, we indulge all the reality we can now have of a sort of conference with the dead by repairing to the scene which, as far as they are on earth, they still inhabit. They still inhabit is in italics in the text. The tusk that covers the great man's tomb, and then by extension, I think any tomb worth paying attention to, is simply and literally italics, the great person himself. We can attain, he says, the craft and the mystery by which we may spiritually, each of us in their several spheres, compel the earth and the oceans to give up their dead alive. So that's, that's the, I mean, that, that's what the act of the imagination or the act of secular necromancy. And it is not an act that's explicable in terms of religious beliefs or any, or any, or any um, sort of, of, um, of metaphysics. So um, this is, a, speaking here of the Enlightenment, and I'm obviously not the first person to think that something important happens in the Enlightenment for the, dead, the appropriation of the dead for history for the memorialization of the nation and for historical formation rather than for religious purposes. But, but I want to just at least suggest briefly that my version is different from sort of various other versions of this story. And I just, just for a second, want to speak about the great French trio of historians of death, which is say, Michel Foucault, Philippe Arias, and Michel Vauvel. All of them offer narratives of the disappearance and the disenchantment of the dead body in modern times. So for Vauvel, a Marxist, this is a very good thing. He looks at the decline of testamentary bequests for masses for the dead and this evidence for secularization. For the deeply devout and Catholic Ariès, it's a terrible thing. It leads to the fear of, it leads to fear of, of, of um, premature burial. It leads to the saccharine and meaningless romanticization of the dead in the 19th century. And it leads to silence about uh, the dead today. And for Foucault, um, the, the world, the death gives way to the regime of life and, that, and the clinical gaze, and that imbricates bodies and this new notion of biopower. So I don't want to argue against any of these, but I just want to say that the story I'm telling tonight is not about the disappearance of enchantment. It's about um, its reinvention. So from the 18th to the 20th century new ways, the dead become, if anything, more visible than ever been before. So my history is really a historical anthropology of the ways in which the presence of the dead enchants our purportedly disenchanted world. It's about layers of meaning from the deep past which lie beneath the present and are reused and reimagined. In fact, the dead have never been more prominent, more apprehensible, or more important than in this supposedly disenchanted age. So that's kind of going from the really cosmic to the 18th century, and I want to focus on a, on, on a moment, and that's what my, my, my pictures are about, part two. I want to speak about how we get from this, which is the Cemetery of the Innocents in a churchyard, which you see are sort of messy. Um, we could talk about the sort of geography of each of these places, but what I really want you to see is church and mess. To this, which is a classical cemetery, which is a cemetery in Sheffield, but I could show you 20 of these. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of place that comes into being, and I want to talk to you about how one gets from one of these uh, to the other. So I could let me begin at the beginning, which is really how we get to the churchyard, and I'll show you that very briefly. So, and that's really the story of the appropriation of the dead by the church uh, in, in antiquity. This actually took centuries to do, but there's sort of emblematic moments, and Gibbon has a wonderful one when he describes um, the, 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 the translation of the bones of St. Babylon into the grove of Apollo and Antioch, and the symbol of the gods quit speaking. So he, says he sees the invasion of the sanctuary by these dead bodies as, as this epochal moment. But in general, um, over the next three or four centuries, certainly by the 10th and 11th century, in most of Europe, the churchyard had become the only place that a Christian uh, could be decently buried. The churchyard had a relic in, it, in it, its center, and access to the churchyard was closely guarded by the clergy. To be excluded from the churchyard was, was the great punishment from, of excommunication. 
So this is this really, this a longer version of this is the story of the making of a new Christian necrogeography out of the Roman, and it's, it's probably the most, one of the most radical changes in the transition from, from classical antiquity to, to, to Christianity, um, because it involves, it, so much is involved in this. But basically, what you have is, is the, the creation of this necrogeography that I showed you earlier, of a community of the dead gathered together over generations. It's the Christian community of a place in deep time. Or if you want to take an anti-clerical view, as the Enlightenment philosophers often took, it's through creation of a land of clerical tyranny over the dead that they ruled for over a thousand years. So I want to talk less about the decline of, of these Christian and largely local communities. Than the, that is to say, I want to talk less about the unmaking of history than about the making of these new cosmopolitan places of the dead, which is to say cemeteries. So what is a cemetery? So put negatively, it's not a churchyard. That is to say, it was not controlled by the church. It was not autarkic. It was not old. It did not make the dead evident in mounding heaps of soil and wavy church floors, but instead hid them decorously in specially designed landscapes amid a flurry of monuments that proclaimed memory, or in any case, declared the memory of those who could afford them. It didn't make the claims that the churchyard did, that to say that it represented a Christian community of the living and the dead. Um, it, it rejected the deep historical roots of the churchyard in favor of other and far more secular histories. In some, it was everything that the places of the dead in the old regime were not, or what they claimed to be. So in the first instance, the churchyard is not, the cemetery is not the churchyard. And where cemeteries were being made, they were explicitly discussed as not churchyards. In, and we can all speak about this in law and pr private property and graves and a whole world. The cemeteries that return to an ancient, a purportedly ancient way of dealing with the dead, of owning the property where the dead are buried and so forth. So number one, it's not the churchyard. But more formative, affirmatively, let me put it the other way around, um, the cemetery was a genuinely new and spectacularly versatile space for the work of the dead in the making of memory and community and in the rec recollection of history for all sorts of people and for many different purposes. So take Père Lachaise, the first great cemetery, the model of all cemeteries. There you have the ashes of Abelard and Eloise. I'll come back to those in a moment. Um, the ashes of the doors, Jim Morrison. That's easy to find by the smell of marijuana. And the tomb of Victor Noir, who died in, the eight, in an 18th century duel and was buried under a life-size bronze sculpture whose genital area is rubbed shiny by tens of thousands of women who think it brings fertility or love. There's actually a fence around that right now. There are also monuments to the murder of Dachau, Auschwitz, Neugammon, and Robin's book, all within 100 uh, uh, meters of each other. In other words, this is a heterogeneous, cosmopolitan community um, of the dead, and it always was that. So a very early guidebook writes, in these refuges of the dead, are gathered together all ranks and ages. The Russian is by the side of the Spaniard, the Protestant, the Jew, not far from the Catholic. People of radically different opinions find themselves finally meeting in the dust. So they're not that random. People sort of sorted the bodies out. So the cemetery has little sections of people who might have had an affinity, but they're pretty close to people they wouldn't like. I mean, so Marx is next to Spencer. It's not exactly where you want to be. So, you know, so, so, but in general, the point is, they're not autarkic, one group of people, they're all, these are all strange people. Then, to take the long view then, the, the dead in the cemetery <clears throat> um, lent their authority um, to a new order, just as the dead in the churchyard had lent their authority to the making of, of, of the new, of the new, of the, of, of the, of the new, of the new, um, uh, a Christian order. In the late 18th century, the corpse, this magical life image concealed in the shrine of the body, which Diogenes suggested that we just toss over the walls because it was meaningless, came to work its magic, what is say, idolatrous magic, you might say, in the service not of a transcendent God, though it did that too, or more precisely in the service of the body of Christ on earth, that is to say, the church, but of other gods, of family, of civil society, of nation, and of class. If the church and, and the churchyard was a matrix of Christians living and dead, the cemetery was a space in which their bodies supported the interests of the major political, 
and cultural innovations of the 19th century. That also is a point that was not lost by contemporaries. Let me give an example, Bismarck, 1849. He visited the cemetery in Berlin where the dead of the March Revolution of 1848 were buried. After this visit, he wrote to his, his wife, as he says, with a heart full of bitterness. He could not forgive these dead, he told her, but more to the point, he could not forgive the idolatry practiced at the graves of these criminals whose every tombstone boasts of freedom and rights, a mockery of God and man. He cannot, he continues, stop his heart from swelling with poison when he thinks about, and again, here's the critical term, when he thinks about the idolatrousness with which Berliners come to these graves. And they kept coming, forbidden in some years, tolerated in others, with or without disturbances. To this day, the cemetery in, in Friedrichheim Park, a place unthinkable in the old regime, remains a site of memorial reflection for the German left. But there are also new places where it was the Luxembourg and the Pleche de Berry, there's we have other pockets of, of left burial as of right burial. But my interest in this is that at the time, people get it, that, there is a, that, these, that these dead are saying something. And that it's a strange, in the sense, by idolatry, I mean that one acts as if unliving ma dead matter were, were alive. That's, that's my point. So um, the question, how, how do we get to this, from the one, to, one to the other. So look, there's a big administrative history. There's a story of public health, which I think is actually much, much overrated. Um, but I, I, I want to um, give it, make it a sort of different and shorter history, and this is a history of the imagination. And I want to begin in England in, in 1720, which is when Sir John Van Barrow, the architect, and his patron, uh, the third Earl of Carlisle, conceived of and built this, which is the first freestanding mausoleum since antiquity. There are inspirations where, there are several inspirations. On the one hand, the tomb of Cecilia Matala on the Via Appia, but there are also, in interesting ways, um, reflections of the, of the European tombs in the cemetery in Surat, um, in the coast of, of Gujarat. Um, which was well known, and, and, and we know that Van Boren knew them, uh, which were the first sort of large freestanding tombs outside of Europe, where Dutch and, Brit and English merchants built these tombs in sort of, as I say, with a style that's roughly speaking um, called the, the, uh, the Indo-Saracenic. Indo, um, Indo -Saracenic. So in fact, what happens when he died, uh, terrible gout, he dies, the tomb wasn't quite ready, he was buried, uh, in, 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 the local, in the local church, but that actually gave him, or rather his body, um, a second chance to offer insult to the Christian community of the dead. In 19, 1749, it was exhumed from the parish church uh, where it actually belonged and was moved as he wished to its permanent tomb. And a plaque in the church still today tells you that, the, that he'd actually been moved to new pagan quarters. <laughs> to some extent, this gesture was negative. Carlyle and his architects were anti-clerical, and it, their scheme was to sort of represent active hostility to the old necrogeography. The Earl's burial, Van Boer wrote, would comport with those that have been practiced, had been practiced by the most polite peoples before priestcraft got carcasses into their <laughs> keeping. And by polite people, of course, he meant the aristocracy of ancient Rome. But the tomb was something more. It was a tomb in the garden. In fact, whole villages had been raised to produce this particular, this, this particular garden. And that garden was not Eden, but it was Elysium. And again, I'm not making up it was Elysium. His daughter wrote a much published poem about how her father was buried in Elysium. Now, at more or less the same time this was going on, um, the Viscount Cobham began work with, again with Van Burrow on what became the most influential English garden of the 18th century, which is to say the Garden of Stowe in Buckinghamshire. Passing by the church, we went on to what is called the Elysian Fields, writes Jeremiah Miles, an early revision of the garden. There were, oh, no actual dead there, but there was a tomb. Indeed, there was the archetypal great tomb, a building by the architect Kent called the Mausoleum. So in 1733, Kent, one of the founders of the English style, scooped out a, a, a small valley alongside the stream, and he dammed it up to create two lakes to represent the river Styx. 40 acres, 16 acres of Elysium in all. Now, 
like a churchyard, Kent's mausoleum in, in, in the Elysian fields um, and the other sort of monuments there were meant to produce a, community, a congregation of the dead, an imagined congregation. Unlike a churchyard, there weren't any actual bodies in Stowe. We're going to get the bodies in Elysia uh, in a moment. These dead are sort of virtual and disparate. They're not the Christians of any one place gathered together, um, but a select number of, of great leaders and poets from, and a dog from different eras joined in a neoclassical paradise imagined through the poetry of Virgil and the landscaping of Kent. So they form a kind of national cemetery without the actual um, dead uh, being there. And then the image of sort of dying and going to Elysia becomes a common image, especially for what happens to philosophes. So Elysia becomes an imagined place to go. Now I wanna, I'm gonna jump ahead a couple of slides because I realize this is in a slightly different order. And I would start with this and I'll go back to the tomb we have just a second. So in 1776, there's a, another gesture toward a virtual national cemetery, and this one is much grander and more explicit. That year, excavations began here. Actually, the excavation had begun 20 years earlier. It's a burial tumulus in the gardens of the Danish Royal Park at Jägerpreis, about 40 kilometers from Copenhagen. And this would become um, the nidus of actually the sort of Ur Memorial Garden faux cemetery as you'll see in just, in just a second. So bones were discovered here and, and various Neolithic tombs, and this confirmed the idea that this royal park had belonged to Danish kings for at least three or 4,000 years. And then a world of the modern dead could be built around this world of the ancient dead. So the, this tumulus was, in, was, in, a, was, was, was in, in, in the center. But then what happens is that they, the, the king's minister commissioned 54 monuments chosen by his chief minister from a history. This book is, the title is interesting, Great and Good Deeds of Danes, Norwegians, and Holsteiners. So there was no Denmark. You're making Denmark out of Holsteiners and Norwegians and Danes. And you're gathering from all over the place. And so what you see, these kind of things. Um, so the, these sort of plinths, so for example, Tycho Brahe's there, the, the, um, the Danish nobleman and astronomer who employed Kepler. He's actually not there. No one's under these graves. He's actually in Prague. He, um, Tycho Bray. But in any case, the point is, I'm not showing you all of these, but we have documented in many, many books these whole fake cemeteries. So we have the cemetery in the imagination, if you will, before we have the cemetery, the real cemetery. The first sort of real tomb in Elysium is Rousseau's tomb. So why do I say Rousseau's tomb um, is, 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 is in Elysium? Well, because the park where he's buried at Emonville um, was a park that was explicitly modeled on the park in Stowe. And it was thought to be especially appropriate that Rousseau would be buried in such a setting because the park in the Nouvelle Eloise, or Eloise's garden, was meant to be based on Stowe. Now again, whether it's really based on Stowe, this, that, the story is, told at the time of making this, that this is sort of self refer this is, this is, this is, this is self-referential. So you build this kind of tomb, and I'll show you, we'll see another reference to this um, in, in just a second. And then um, this tomb would in turn become a kind of secular pilgrimage site, um, as the, the tombs of the 48 revolutionaries and so many more. So an English botanist um, visits Emmanuel basically a theme park by then. I mean, we have lots of models of this and so forth. Anyway, and, but like Godwin, he's almost embarrassed by his own idolatry. But that didn't actually stop him. It's impossible, he writes, to contemplate this monument without various reflections and emotions. Many people may wonder that I should bring a little portion of moss from its top. I know some gentle minds in England to whom such a relic would not be unacceptable and I thought with secret satisfaction that the ghost of Rousseau, if conscious, would not have been offended. Well, so we have Rousseau's tomb, but Rousseau's tomb is clearly also a play on probably the most famous painting of a tomb, which is Poussin, one of the Poussin's paintings of, of um, um, uh, the shepherds in Arcadia. Now, even if no one knew anything about the shepherds in Arcadia, Arcadia becomes another model. And how does that work? Well, there's, again, intricate little histories. And so maybe the most famous way of, that this makes its way into popular culture is through a strange 
but wildly translated man named Solomon Gessner, who is, his critics today will say, no one understands quite why he was so popular. He was usually popular. Goethe thought he was great. All the greats think he was terrific. And he basically wrote neo-theocritean uh, pastorals. By the way, I should just point out here, the, the Poussin tomb gets reinscribed and made in plaster casts and put all over gardens everywhere. And this is Gessner's tomb, which gets spread everywhere. So the, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that the cemetery comes out of this history of imagining previous versions of dealing, of dealing with the dead. And the dead bodies sort of make their way into this imaginative landscape. Now, I have one. I was going to show you a picture of, of, of what is, I think, actually the first modern cemetery, which actually has real bodies in it, which is in Calcutta. <laughs> because the, the worthies of the East India Company said they didn't want to be buried around the churchyard. So there's tons of room around the churchyard. Yeah. There's this argument that you don't, you know, that's do with the crowding. Nothing with crowding. There's the whole, still today, you know, miles around the churchyard. And they built this kind of Roman cemetery. And the virtue of this Roman cemetery is that they could be buried with their Hindu mistresses, some guys with their monkeys, so you could, which you could never do in a churchyard, obviously. So it gave, so they, and so they actually saw themselves as these newer Romans who could build a Roman style, as a Roman style cemetery. Aspect of that architecture is going to be translated to, um, to Europe. But let me move to the sort of end of my story and, and, and to the end of the, of the talk um, by taking you to um, the foundation, making a pair of chaise. So if you want to get the background to Père Lachaise, um, obviously the French Revolution and coming at Napoleon, but aesthetically, um, and even in terms of its body, it has to do with this place. So during the revolution, there was an awful lot of iconoclasm, smashing up of tombs and so forth. Um, and a man named Alexandre Lenoir in 1791 started collecting these torn up tombs and these bodies and gathering them in a memorial garden in a museum called Elysium. So there are real bodies in this, as well as tombs of bodies, um, as well as tombs without bodies. So amongst the bodies that he managed to gather there were, for example, the bodies of Abelard and Eloise, the real bodies of Abelard and Eloise. We have the provenance of their bodies is very good. And also purportedly the bodies of the sort of bad boys of the, of the old regime, Moliere and La Fontaine, which had been dug up by various militant sections and were supposed to be put somewhere else and never were, and he got them. Those are probably fake bodies. I mean, they're not fake bodies. They're not the bodies that, of the people they purport to be. <laughs> so in any case, there he builds, this, he builds this, 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 this sort of place, and this does sort of fine um, until the restoration in which his museum, as a memorial site for the French Revolution, is closed. And so what becomes of the bodies? Well, the bodies are very nicely moved. It's, well, I should just backtrack. There's one actually sort of amazing part of this. The gardens of tombs, the Jardin de Tombeau, were a big deal. And one of the biggest scores of tombs belonged to the Duc d'Orléans. And the people who were building Père Lachaise actually hoped that they could get the land of the Duc d'Orléans to build the first cemetery which from my point of view would have just unbelievably cool that you could actually build a real cemetery on this faux cemetery, but it didn't work out. Um, the finance ministry got the land, so they got this other land. But they then moved, they then they built Père Lachaise, and then um, they, they ended up moving these, moving these memorials. So Moliere's and Fontaine's remains went to Père Lachaise in March of 18, in, in 18, in 17, 17, and three months later, there were the two new arrivals, which is to say the medieval lovers, Abelard and Eloise. A great funeral brought first the bodies, and six months later, their mausoleum from the old Elysian fields to the new Elysian fields at Père Lachaise. And so the medieval pair from a distant world could be reimagined as bourgeois lovers and a new memorial park for the dead on the eastern outskirts of Paris, where tens of thousands of families would find their eternal home. By 1865, Bedeker's Guide recommends three hours for a tour because there are 16,000 monuments to see from the most magnificent mausoleums to unpretending crosses. Père Lachaise then becomes the trademark 
of the world's first true cemetery. It becomes a generic term to describe greater or lesser expanses of monuments set among trees, shrubs, and flowers with walkways with the dead hidden under, this, under the surface. And by generic, I meant that the emperor of Brazil says he wants a Père Lachaise, and the necropolis of Glasgow says it is a Père Lachaise, and Coma is a Père Lachaise, and so is the Ricoleta in, in Buenos Aires. So Père Lachaise becomes the word for this new style of place, which was inconceivable, actually, in the old regime. So that's in itself important, a cosmopolitan, movable kind of, kind of, of, of a Copenhagen uh, had, a, had a place. So a new kind of space of the dead, a rather in reinvention of classical spaces, real or imagined, came into being in the early 19th century. And it would become the staging place for all manner um, of cultural work. But there's a continuity. And let me conclude by going back to Diogenes, back to the general observations which I began, and conclude with one answer to Diogenes, to Diogenes that I find um, persuasive. So I've already said that care of the dead like the incest taboo, has continued across the rupture between the old regime and the modern era to do with our work of coming into culture. The dead work alone and collectively for this civilizational purpose and for a very broad range of more limited purposes. They worked over the millennium of the interests of a transcendent religion and a religious community. They work today largely but not exclusively the interests of history and of memory. But if you ask my own answer, why do we care for the dead, or what makes it possible to care for the dead, um, it's largely the answer that the art critic David Hickey gives. He said, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but roughly speaking, if the, th if the things that magicians did were in fact real, they would lose much interest to us moderns. If we want, and if on the hand, so we interest in magic shows, they're not, that's not really happening, that's not what's, that's not what we're, would, would, would grasp us. But if we watch their show always thinking of the tricks that were being played us, they'd become empty and cold. You don't go to a magic show and constantly telling yourself it's not a magic show. It's like going to the theater and constantly telling yourself it's theater. So unmasking might have its place, but that's not, as I hope you can tell, the, been the purpose of my, of my, of, of my talk. Instead, um, and this is Hickey writing about a show in Las Vegas. We watch elephants disappear without inquiring how it's done, and we listen to a chorus asking that we be made to reappear in the same spirit. We understand the whole tradition of disappearing things and restoring them is located where it should be, in rituals of death and resurrection. We simply take pleasure in seeing the impossible appear, pos appear possible and the invisible made visible. Because of these illusions were not just illusions, we should not be what we are, mortal creatures who miss our dead friends and thus can appreciate levitating tigers and portraits by Raphael for what they are, songs of mortality sung by the prisoners of time. So my answer to why we care for the dead is largely beyond metaphysics, is the dead body conjures with that sort of magic. It's a magic that in this modern age we still believe in. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take a, a couple of questions before the reception. My name is Carla Rothstein. I direct uh, Columbia's Death Lab. It's a research and design space, and our focus is on the future of cemeteries in the city. And so I very much appreciate your talk and in terms of unpacking how we got to where we are now. Um, but our urban environments have a logistic problem in terms of a logistic problem, a spatial problem, in terms of continuing to bury the dead. Um, and cremation, while logistically um, efficient, uh, has environmental consequences. And so I'm curious whether you've thought about how our urban populations, which continue to grow, um, will honor the dead. I mean, look, I, I mean, the cheap way out would be this. I had a bumper sticker once that, I, that, that read, historians tell it like it was. <laughs> um, but that, that's not fair. Look, I mean, I think that what's in fact happening in most parts of the world, as you know, is that cremation um, is on the rise. And, and furthermore, um, cremation is both slotted into traditional um, 
cremated remains traditional places for the dead. So churches are for the first time in 100 years now filling up with dead again. Um, Grace Cathedral has score hundreds of cremated remains of AIDS victims, for example. So one answer is cremation. Now, obviously, cremation has ecologic, bad ecological effects. It uses vast amounts of energy. And so the new alternative, as you know, are these um, natural burials. So these natural burials have a 19th century predecessors in sort of weaker baskets. But the modern version, as you know, um, Marin has several important ones, is basically to compost the dead using the very best modern compost technology. So when you read what they tell you to do, it's sort of like doing your garden. You know how you have to mix dry with wet, a certain amount of soil, you know, all the things that keep the compost pile working. And that's great, except that it uses vast amounts of space. It needs to be guarded. I mean, it, has, it needs to be protected from animals. So I don't have a sense of my, my own, if you ask me just to predict, I, my suspicion is that cremation will continue to increase in, 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 in popularity. But what strikes me in, in this um, uh, studies is the amazing sort of ingenuity of people in inventing new things to do with cremated bodies. Um, so I mean, I'm slightly embarrassed, but the New York Post asked me for the 10 weirdest things I learned in this, in this uh, and I actually did it because I do anything Julia Hobb asked me to do, so I wrote these 10 weird things. And the weirdest things have to do with cremation. And so that's some weird, some of the touching, but I had friends, for example, um, in, in rural, rural Virginia who took the remains of their buddy and put them in, in black powder shells and shot them in the air. And I tell you, they hadn't read Hunter Thompson. They sort of made this up. And then they put the rest of the remains in a deer lick. So the deer would, of the ashes, so the deer would eat the, the remains and the next season they'd shoot them. <laughs> so you ask yourself, really? Yeah. <laughs> And I can tell you more. So, my, but there's people. Someone told me they took the remains of their father, who's a professional photographer, and put it in little 35 millimeter canisters and put them all over the world where their father had taken pictures. So people are endlessly reinvented with cremation. So if you ask me what will really happen with urban space, I think it's a long way before we do co composting for all but the rich in, in Marin County, and and and, and all the indicators are that cremation. And a third, a third of Roman Catholics now in the Diocese of California cremate. So even in, until the 1960s, you know, was resistant to cremation is increasing. So, so I think that if you, I mean, this I have no expertise on this, but my my my, th my thought is that it's going to be cremation. Wendy, okay. pick on me. Go ahead. <laughs> do some violence to him by turning his he into a she. That, oh, here, uh, now I'm broadcast. Um, I think that if you think of, as, he was a novelist and a rhetorician and he knew what he was doing when he said, my friend, he. And in, in the literary world, we call that the biographical fallacy, when you impose the life on the, on the writing and insist that the writing must only reflect the life. And of course, of course, the death of Mary Wollstonecraft went into that. But he had his reasons for wanting to conceal her as a he friend, which is to keep from being lumped with uh, Abelard and Eloise. In other words, this is not just the heartbroken lover losing the other pod that's attached to him through life and having this kind of you know, organic sense of loss and wanting to be reunited and all that. He, he wanted to amalgamate their relationship with something more like Montaigne's with his dead friend or any of these really intellectual and important friendships that were valued through the ages. He, he wanted to give that to Mary Wollstonecraft. I mean, I quoted the book as his, but I, I guess- Good, that's know, all I care about. <laughs> This is your area of expertise. <laughs> So I'm wondering if this concept that we're running out of space is really a concept if you think about these natural burials and the body being composted as it is in New York City in the public cemetery for sure. There's a million burials and they re have reused the graves over and over many times. So this, this notion that we're running out of space, I'm wondering if that's sort of the political um, way of removing the dead and not talking about certain groups of people and whatnot in a contemporary um, well, context. Actually, the, 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 the burial of the poor 
they still buried in coffins. I think it's five years before they can be dug up. These, 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 these um, running to the California version of composting the dead is more, is more rapid, and it's not, it's not of the poor, it's of the rich who put things there. So I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't, um, you know, it sort of depends on what space is one, what considers suitable. I mean, you know, I have a supervised architecture student once who was going to put column bearing under three white You know, so you could make a claim that that's a way of urban, 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 urban <laughs> internment. You see, you see what I mean? So yeah, I, I'm not saying, I'm not making a judgment whether it's good or bad. Yeah. What I'm doing is following your lead and saying it's kind of a political statement, whatever you do. I totally buy I totally take this political statement. As you know, there's a great people trying to produce a register of the, all the, the names of all the dead in the college field. And actually, collecting names of the dead is now a huge enterprise. In fact, it's, I think it's probably the major modern memorial enterprise. I mean, that's what Yad Shem does. And, I mean, the, the name collecting is a whole other, I mean, it's a whole other interesting story. And efforts to get names near bodies or near ashes is another big part of the story. So I mean, any, any use of space clearly is, is political. And even in the 19th century, people asked themselves, so what means we were running out of space? The question, is, um, Ruskin sort of says, well, yeah, you use the space for an insurance company or a railway station. You could use it for the dead in the city. It's just you just don't want to. Right. You know, I mean, so I mean, you, you don't want to. You don't want to. But so, you're saying, you were saying that naming is essentially a cultural thing that that is an effort to distinguish yourself, to distinguish the culture, human culture, from nature. I'm saying, this, look, it's a long, humans name their dead species of stone. Historically, the number of names on the landscape increases logarithmically from the late 18th century on. We have 200,000 names from late antiquity, roughly speaking, of the dead. We don't even collect that from the entire end of, end of late antiquity through the early 18th century. I mean, I can't get an exact number, but tinier. I mean, you know, then starting the late 18th century, churchyards in which 5% of the people were named, you'd get this at 40% being named by the end of the century. And then in World War I, you get these naming memorials that leads to Vietnam, that leads to memorial, that leads to as a whole. So that's a separate history. Naming has always been connected with burials there in, in, in Talmudic commentaries on Genesis. So that's Nothing is new about the dead. My interest is that these primordial things that people do, roughly speaking, in the same way forever, they just do it in lots larger, not smaller, more different places for different purposes. That's, that's, that's the claim. So that's why I want to sort of combine that kind of deep anthropology on the one hand with very specific historical questions. And you know, we have a lot of time, and this book goes on forever about this subject. I can tell you, you know, why this change happens here. You know, I mean, you see what I mean? I mean that's where we get into the sort of ordinary work of the historian to say how to get from here to there. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Let's take one more question. Sure. We have one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, your reference to magic and uh, magic and the belief in, in the illusion of magic towards the end of your talk, do you reference that? Is it about that we honor the body of the dead person with a reference to another world, because if we didn't, and if this is all there is, it would be a bit too much of a nightmare. No, I mean, look, what I mean by magic, I mean, I mean, what I'm trying to say is I mean, we, the difference is it's not really, it's not really the case that tigers levitate. But it is the case that you watch this in a sense that you're, that you're engaged with levitating tigers. So what maybe, I, let me tell you, look, what got me to thinking about this is, 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 is the following story. Um, uh, so in 1995, when I was still trying to figure out what this book is about, um, I was giving a lecture in Germany. And I think it was the first time I was actually lecturing in Germany, in German, and so it felt like sort of going back a uh, place that my parents had fled. And so it was sort of a big deal for me. And um, I've been there before as a tourist, but this was there as a professor. So my wife self suggests, look, take some of the ashes of your father and put them on the grave of your grandfather in Oldsdorf Cemetery. 
Now, I knew the grave of my grandfather in Oldsdorf Cemetery because my grandmother, who lived with us, had a picture of it on her, on her desk. So I knew, I knew this grave intimately. My father's ashes I had scattered in a flower bed in Virginia 13 years before. And the flower bed is, you know, as big as this whole set of chairs. So it was a big flower bed. And um, there been many seasons and winter and so forth. And um, I told my wife, look, there, I don't have the ash of my father. There's just dirt in the flower bed. And insofar this is a homeopathic atom from my father, it's indistinguishable from the ashes, from the potassium and the nitrogen and whatever is in the fertilizer, which we put in every year with the flowers. So um, she says, take it anyway. <laughs> so the point about this is if I look at the reality is my father's words to this would have been unzin. <laughs> and um, Unquestionably, my father was a pathologist, a man of science. He would have thought this was complete bullshit. But needless to say, I took my little Ziploc bag of the dirt from this place, and I took them to this grave in Olsdorf, and I put them on the grave, and it actually meant a great deal to me. I sort of felt I had, my father had been buried where he probably would have been buried had it not been for Hitler. But the, that's the thing where I take view of magic. I know that there are no ashes in this sort of place. On the other hand, I certainly did not do this with any degree of, of irony um, or cynicism or disbelief. So that's what I meant by a kind of magic you can believe in. I mean, I believe in anthropological distance. I understand what I'm doing. But on the other hand, while doing it, it had this sort of magic. And I take it to be a secular magic because I don't, don't I, I think, I, I have personally no sense that this has anything to do with afterlives or I mean anything that you would vaguely call religion or metaphysics. It's, and I call it magic. I don't love the word because I know magic has other associations. But for want of a better word, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I call it. <laughs>